I'm going to share a few things with you guys tonight that um, are going to be applicable no matter what kind of camera you're using. Um, some things that might be useful to you, and we'll talk about, I mean, just whatever questions you guys have, feel free to shout them out. And then if you've got tips or things of your own that you want to share, I'd love that too. I, uh, I started studying photography like when I was in high school. I was lucky enough to go to high school that actually had a dark room and uh, college as well. Did a few things there. Back, back remember, remember film? I don't know if you guys, it was a roll of this stuff that you would put in your camera in the back and it, would, it, had, it had chemicals on it, silver and whatnot, to make it so it would capture the light that way. Uh, anybody still doing? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I had one of those when I was on my mission. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. I, didn't I have a funny too. story about that, but I'll I'll save it, and if we have time at the end, I'll share. All right. Yeah. Be sure. Be sure. Mission film story. So there were there were a few guys that were in my in my photo classes and stuff, especially in high school, that claimed to only be there because they wanted to be in a dark room with the girls, but uh, that was not me. I was serious, very serious about the whole thing. So anyway. I've kind of made the transition out of digital as most everybody else has. And, and I do have some camera toys and stuff I'll show you as we're going through. But uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that photograph is literally a graph, right? It's, it's a recording of light, the same way that your grandma's phonograph is a recording of sound. So as we're talking about mm -hmm. photography, there we go. As the next one came up, um, we're talking about light and how best to capture that light, no matter what your, what your scene is, no matter what it is you're trying to, to save, you know, whether it's your Instagram of your lunch or whether it's a picture of your kids or this is a shot down around St. George um, that I caught here last month or so. It's all about light. Um, the quality of light that you get is super, super important. Okay, and so the first thing as far as pro tip goes that I wanna share with you guys, whether you're using your phone or whether you're using a fancy camera, whatever it is, is making sure that you're taking taking your pictures when there's the best light around. Um, you maybe heard people talk about golden hour before. Anybody heard about golden hour? That ring a bell? So yep. there are times of day that are best for getting that nice warm golden light, like in the shot that you just saw. This this was taken during golden hour in the morning. And so if we look at our day and as the sun kind of crosses, you know, overhead, here's noonday, and here's evening and sunset. That first kind of hour that we have after the sun rises is when you have this time when the light is a little bit softer and it's a little bit warmer. Uh, and it's a great time to take photos. So just after sunrise, and it may not always appeal because sunrise is kind of early. I'm a morning person. Anybody else a morning person out there? Do we have some morning people? Peter, <laughs> sure. <right? laughs> but if you're not a morning person, the same kind of phenomenon happens kind of the last hour of the day before the sun sets. That's another kind of golden hour of time. Now I'll mention on here as well, there's blue hour. Golden hour, you still have direct light, right? So there's stuff that's coming in through the atmosphere, shining on stuff, giving it that warm hue like you saw there. Blue hour is the hour before sunrise and just after sunset. And there's no direct light, but it gives everything kind of a blue shade, kind of a blue hue. Let's look at a couple of examples. This is, oh yeah, let's check this out. So here's the reason why, here's the science behind it for those that are, that are science heads. The reason you get golden hour in the evening is because when your sun is over here, look how much more atmosphere it's got to pass through versus when it's overhead and coming straight down on you, right? So we get a lot of this blue and purple and green light diffused and it doesn't actually reach us. Instead, we get these great orange and yellow and red hues and makes everything just, just gorgeous, right? So I was shooting some shots downtown uh, with this guy. This is one of my favorite cameras, and the zoom down kind of makes it so you can't see. This is my camera drone. Had this guy a couple of years, the second one of these I've had. And uh, we put it up over there by Library Square, and you can see there's the courthouse and the Grand America and all that. And the sun in this shot, are you still seeing my mouse, hopefully, kind of circling yeah. over there? The sun's right over here, beyond this building. And so we're still getting that gorgeous golden hour light and it colors the clouds. And you can even see it on the buildings, right? The light's still direct. We've got some over here and on Little America as well. And over here, some of these ones off Main Street. So that's like your typical golden hour kind of shot. And as the sun went down, I hung around. I still had battery left in the drone and stuff. And so I got a couple of blue hour shots at the same time, just keeping it up there. And you can see now there's no direct light. We've got no glowing orange on any of the buildings, that kind of thing. And we start to have these blue hues creep in because we're moving from golden hour into blue hour and seeing some of that kind of light. If I go one more, this is one of the last ones I took right before I landed. And uh, it's, it's really looking blue now. There's no direct light of any kind. We got a little bit of orange hanging around the horizon, 
but all of the subject and everything that I was shooting that night is now kind of all in this blue. So, I mean, you know, a lot of it is personal preference, right? Whether you like to shoot stuff with kind of that warm golden look, whether you like stuff that's more cold in the blue hour, but if you're shooting outdoors and you're shooting landscape, be aware that the hour before and after sunrise and before and after sunset are kind of magical times. That's the when you get the best light there is. Doesn't mean you can't take photos other times of the day. Certainly hope that you do. But I mean, you're going to get just just gorgeous light during those times. So I guess my question is, is, is did you plan the heart on the building? No, but I went down there for that very purpose. So when we first started the COVID shutdown and all that, hotels all around the nation started doing this with the little heart shapes and things using, you know, the different hotel rooms with lights and curtains and things to make hearts. Uh, of course, most of the hotels at that point were empty. They could do whatever they wanted, but I wanted to catch one just to kind of remember 2020 by, right? So yeah, there's the Grand America with its little heart. Little America had one too, but the angle wasn't right from this spot over here by Library Square to see it. But uh, yeah, and I got to tell you, it was eerie because it was, I mean, nobody was downtown. This was during the strict, strict shutdown. In fact, I kind of kept looking around, you know, to see if anybody was going to come and talk to me, but it was quiet and I had a chance to fly for probably about an hour just taking pictures and things. And these are, these are some of the best. That's something else. Don't be afraid to just throw stuff away if it doesn't turn out. Don't be disappointed. Like I say, I flew for probably an hour. I took several gigabytes worth of photos on this particular evening. And look, I'm showing you what, three. So that's okay. I mean, you just take your best ones and, and then, you know, learn and then take more next time. And that's totally okay. So anyway, there's a little bit about life. I usually try and take like three of the same shot. Just make sure I didn't miss, miss anything. Yep, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. I mean... There's, there's no film anymore, right? We're not in the era that I was when I was in high school. You, you got many as you got room for in your memory card. And memory cards are cheap, man. So take lots of shots. You can always throw away the bad ones later. Um, speaking about light, even when we're talking about indoors and shooting, you know, perhaps, I mean, birthday parties or food or whatever your thing is, make sure that you're mindful of your light. Don't get your shadow of your phone over your Instagram dinner or, or you know, funny shadows from trees over people that you're doing portraits of up in the forest. Be always be aware of your light, okay? And your, your pictures turn out so much better. Also be aware of light temperature, okay? What am I talking about? There's a temperature of light that comes off bulbs inside your home, and it's changed a little bit over the years. Incandescent bulbs that we used to have in all of our houses was very, very warm. And you may have pictures from when you were younger on film that all seem very yellow. And that's because of the white balance being a little bit off versus the incandescent light inside. But, um, these days, uh, fluorescents and LEDs are a little bit different, but be aware of that. Your camera, even your camera phone, may have a setting to adjust just kind of what light you're shooting in. You've probably seen, oh, this is a cloudy day, or this is a sunny day, or this is an indoor picture. That's what it's doing is, is tweaking the light balance inside when it's making those images for you. You can be aware of that. Otherwise, it's a little bit tricky because you may come out with something that's looking too blue or too yellow, and it's hard to change if you're shooting JPEGs. We'll show you another way how to avoid that just by not shooting JPEGs here in a little bit. We'll talk about some of the more propeller head topics I got saved, but uh, that's a little bit about light. Any questions about that? Things, other tips you guys would share? So um, one thing I'd say about that, Nate, is the quality of your pictures, at least digitally, has a lot to do with the sensor that's in your camera. And not as much as it used to have, it used to be all about the lens. Um, but now it's more about the sensor inside of your camera. Now the lens has its, has its place and, you know, you can get certain shots with certain lenses, but it, it's all about the sensor. If you compare a camera from 10 years ago versus a camera now, you take the exact same picture with the exact same lens, you're going to see a huge difference in how clear it is and, and everything else. And the sensor is what lets in all the light. Um, and obviously the more light it lets in, the crisper and clearer the pictures are no doubt. and so just wanted to mention that yeah good good point and i've actually got a diagram we'll talk more about the actual sensors inside your digital cameras and stuff here in just a little bit too cool all right let's talk about composition for a few minutes okay what am i talking about when i talk about composition i mean what is it you choose to include versus exclude or whatever in your photo right here's what i took again with my with my big yellow drone right here um when i was down around saint george it was a different morning than that other shot, but this is a shot of the southbound lanes of I-15 and a little dirt road that I was off on, kind of going through the, the hoonies just to take some shots of, of the cliff sides and things. Um, and it kind of pleased the, the eye to me just because the layout here. This is a good example of what we call the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds means like you, the human eye and the human brain, for whatever reason, is pleased by the fact that things aren't always centered. 
You can have things that kind of counterbalance on the sides, but we like to divide things into thirds. So you'll notice it's kind of hard to see on here, but I've got grid lines actually drawn on this particular photograph I took. And one goes straight down the freeway, and one is right over here off to the side of this dirt road, um, kind of dividing this shot into thirds. And that was on purpose. That was something that I wanted to be able to capture just that way because it's a pleasing thing. Um, when you're shooting nature shots like I like to do, uh, it's a little bit tricky. I mean, here we got some man-made things that divide it up. Here's another one. Um, this is one I shot up in Yellowstone back in July. And I wanted to just kind of place things to balance out the shot, right? So as far as my grid lines here, I've kind of got my rainbow stuff happening over here in this right-hand third. And I've got this hot pool over here. This is Grand Prismatic Spring over here kind of in the, in the left-hand third. And then you'll notice as far as the up and down thirds with these grid lines, I chose to stick this road across the opposite side of the valley right here on this, on this bottom third line. So it just kind of makes it so things are balanced and not everything is always smack right in the middle. It makes your photograph a little bit more interesting as far as how you lay stuff out. That's a big piece of composition. Um, another piece of composition when you're looking to kind of put together your shot the way that you want um, and you're practicing kind of the art of seeing is what my photo teacher used to call it. When you're practicing your art of seeing, the other thing you can look for that are really fun are called leading lines. I've got an example of those. Oh, one more of rule of thirds first though. I'm getting ahead of myself. Rules are meant to be broken, guys. Photography is an art, it's not a science. And so here, uh, this is Yellowstone Lake, and I wanted to kind of impress upon the viewer the um, reflection in the lake, right? So I kind of got this tree over here on this left third. I kind of got the mountains over here on this side, but I intentionally put this big dividing line right smack in the middle of the shot instead of on one of these thirds to kind of give it the idea that it's a mirror there and you have that, that reflection in the image. So rules are meant to be broken. Anything that I say in here, you know what? Do the exact opposite. And if it works for you, cool. You know what? There's nothing wrong with that. Photography is an art. You can do whatever you feel as long as it's something that you're, you, know, you, you want to do. That's totally fine. All right, leading lines. What's a leading line? When you look at an image, anybody's photograph, your eye tends to kind of travel around, right? And if you're using leading lines in your shots, you may have um, things that you want to control as far as where the user's eye goes. So in this particular shot taken out in the Great Salt Lake, um, I chose to use this road. Can you, can you see, I mean, is it leading your eye anywhere? What's it doing? Pulls my eye, eye to the oh, center. Straight up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, precisely, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, was that Matt? Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, I chose to use the road to lead your eye up from the bottom of the photograph toward these snow-covered mountains and the reflection that you have on either side. So that's an example of a leading line. Uh, Patrick, you got a couple here. Let me see. Can you guys see these? Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. Let, me, let me drop into this one. Speaking of Patrick's Hawaii shots, um, I imagine that you probably planned this one, right, as far as the leading lines in here? Yeah. So you can see here we're using the seawall for the same purpose as I kind of had the road, to draw your eye up and into the photograph. And you can kind of see the tourists and the clouds and everything that you've got in this shot. There was another one. Patrick's really good at leading lines. Look at this one with the walkway. This was probably over on Kauai, wasn't it? Yep. Okay. And again, kind of a more organic shape, right? But it's kind of pulling you in. We've got the borders along the walkway leading you on up here and around the bend. And it kind of makes you think, ah, I wonder what's around that bend. But you're kind of, you're giving the viewers some, some interest in this shot. I like, I've, I liked that there was that car right there too. It was kind of like this surfer dude's car. Oh yeah, it is, huh? And um, to me, it was kind of like leading the the shot up to the car uh, of this guy overlooking the the ocean. And you actually got some surfboards on top there. I think I can see. Very cool. Yeah, great shot. Hmm. I've got. Let me see. I think I've got one more. This is a little bit more organic. I mean, don't feel like you have to have some kind of leading lines in every shot that you take. Sometimes it's really challenging, especially when I'm out in nature. But can anybody spot any leading lines in here? Feels like this. Yeah, interesting. So here, I mean, everything kind of converges, whether you've got the river or you've got the road beside it, or even the shadow on the cliff or the cliff's top itself. It all kind of brings everything, all the views all kind of converge on this spot right over here where the river goes around the bend. 
So it's just kind of fun. Your eye kind of naturally explores all these different lines that lead that direction. So, so it kind of gives you depth. Does it provide depth? Is that what it kind of does? I think in the sense it almost brings it into like a 2D versus 3D kind of, it, it allows for more kind of perception, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It can add some depth to it. And the other thing it does is it, it just adds interest. You know, there's, there's something yeah. going on here. Your eye can kind of explore around. It would be very different as if, I, and, and, you know, this is another drone shot, right? I have, I have infinite flexibility as far as where I face and what I shoot. If I shot a, a, you know, a picture straight at the cliff face, I mean, that's kind of all you get. And it would be very flat. And you'd probably see the detail of the rock, but there wouldn't be a whole lot for your eye to see. And it would, it would look, it would look very flat. You wouldn't have the depth that you have in a shot like this. So anyway. Sometimes you can put too much depth too. If, if like there's nothing to look at beyond where you're pointing, then, then sometimes that makes it look weird. Mm -hmm. And you the know, other like if you're, you're, if you're looking at a, like an ocean horizon and it like the horizon's clear at the top, <laughs> you know, it, it looks off. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, it's, and it's interesting with that kind of thing. I mean, you don't need a textbook to tell you what looks good, right? If it makes you feel a little weird and uncomfortable, probably not what you're going for, unless you really want to take an intentionally weird and uncomfortable shot. You want to do what looks good to your eye, and chances are it's going to look good to somebody else's eye as well. Um, you don't want to get your shots too busy and have too many things in them. Um, this particular shot I panned around and cropped off. There was, there was an RV park just over here to the left of this shot and a whole bunch of other things I didn't want in there distracting you from what I wanted to show in this particular thing. So composition and the art of seeing is something you just got to practice. You know, I mean, get out there and just take some pictures and see what looks good and what doesn't, you know, when you come back and, and you'll kind of gradually get a feel for what you like. And you know what? Chances are you're probably taking pictures for what you enjoy anyway. So just go with it. You know, that's a great way to be. Um, something else I can tell you as far as like doing some unique things, um, watch for unique perspectives. One of the things I love uh, about shooting from the air is, I mean, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. You probably can't do this with a smartphone, right? But you can climb up to a high vantage point where you can get down low and, and shoot something that's up. This is the, uh, the dam at Deer Creek Reservoir. Patrick and I went up there one morning and we're shooting and stuff at sunrise. And one of the most interesting shots I got didn't have the sunrise or the mountains or anything. It was, it was the actual different layers of rock, all the colors and as they go down to the water on this side and over onto the green other side of the dam. It just, it was really interesting to me. I don't know. It was, it was cool. So, I mean, you can look for different perspectives. Here's one that's uh, Fish Lake. I was doing a little inspection of the marina there. You can rent those boats and go out for a day, but I loved the cool blue and white stripes I got over here mm -hmm. and the red of the different gas cans sitting in the back of all of them. Just kind of look for fun angles. You know, you really can't go wrong, but it can be a lot of fun to, to check stuff out and see what's there. Um, and that leads me to my next point. Um, experiment. I mean, like I said, photography is an art. It's not a science. Just try stuff out. Um, a lot of phones these days can provide you with the effect that's called bokeh. And that's where you've got your subject. Notice she's kind of on the left third again. Um, and she's in focus, but everything behind here is kind of that blurry sort of out of focus type thing. That's, that happens when you've got a very shallow depth of field. And so you've got focus just on your subject and everything else is kind of blurry. It brings focus to where's your eye drawn to now? It's drawn to the, the subject, right? We're not using leading lines, but we are using focus to draw our eye. You want to know what's cool about this shot? I took this with my phone. You don't need to have some big fancy lens and some big fancy camera or whatever. Most any, most any camera phone out there now, whatever you know, your OS of choice is going to allow you to do a bokeh effect. They call it different things, hmm. but you can get a great shot with that. So play with portrait that. mode is what it's called on the iPhone. Yeah, iPhones call it portrait mode. I forget what Samsung calls it. Different Android phones call it different things, but you've got it. I'm sure it's there. Play with your settings. You'll find it somewhere. You can track it down. Don't forget the grid lines, too, when we're talking about composition and rule of thirds. Every single camera app out there will allow you to add those lines on so you can see kind of where things are at to line them up and balance them out. Something else you can turn on and check out. Um, let me see. Motion blur. Um, they're a lot of fun. This is, this is where you've got your shutter open for a longer amount of time. And so things that are moving like this creek, this is Little Cottonwood Creek here. Um, you guys have probably also seen shots of like uh, car tail lights at night where the shutter gets left open for a while and you see the streaks of the tail lights or people's headlights. Those are all done with, with the shutter being left open for a while and it gives you some, some cool motion blur. Want to know something else that's cool? 
This is another phone shot. Um, you can fake this. Your, your phone shutter doesn't usually stay open very long, but you can take shots like this and then blur them together. And a lot of phone software in your camera app can do this for you. Patrick, you've got some good ones too. I want to flip over to a couple of yours here. Back to the I was with you when you took that one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That was, that was when we were up camping in Little Cotwood. Um, tell us about this one though. Yeah, that's, that's Kauai. Um, same kind of thing. So a lot of the iPhone, like the newer iPhones have um, what's called a live photo. And what the live photo does is it takes a whole bunch of really fast shots and then it can piece them together into like a short one or two second clip. But one of the editing tools that's on the iPhone that you can use um, instead of making it a clip, we'll stitch them together into this blur feature. Um, and so I, I know a lot of other phones these days have that as well, you know, like with some of the Samsung and Google phones, but <clears throat> that's the trick that they do is instead of using a lens technique, they use um, a software technique. And, and really that, um, that's kind of where the world is these days is, is how can you get software to you know display something on your sensor which then gets you know turned into a picture mm -hmm. um you know to to do what you want and it, you know the best phones these days aren't necessarily the or the, sorry the best cameras on phones these days aren't necessarily the ones with the highest specs or the ones with the best sensors Right. And the ones that can can that have the best software. So, um, and you know, the old saying is, "What what's the best camera out there?" And that's the one you have with you. Yep, I was hoping uh, you would say that. That's a good point. So, I mean, to get a shot like Patrick's here, I could I could lug this guy with me. This is my Sony, and I've got a big old lens on here, and I would have to lug my tripod. I'd have to set it up. I might have to put a filter on it to darken this, so I could leave my shutter open for a longer amount of time to let the water flow. And then I would have to do some post-production on it to be able to get a shot like this. Or, lucky you, if you've got your phone and it happens to be the camera you have with you, you can just pull it off with some of that post-processing and computational photography. Super cool. So, I mean, don't, <laughs> don't doubt what your, what your phone is capable of. So well, if you look at, oh, go ahead. Sorry, really that. fast, Billy. If you look at that album I shared out, uh, it, with the exception of the occasional GoPro shot, every single photo on there is taken with the phone. Um, I don't have a, a mirrorless or an SLR. Well, I have an SL, the SLR, but it's old. And the sensor on it is, is enough, it's old enough to where it looks blurry to me, so I don't use it anymore. Um, and so everything I've done here is with a phone. And it, it, like Nate said, it's more like an art thing. It's, it's, you know, using what your phone can do to, to accomplish what you're trying to get. So, sorry, Billy. No, I was just going to ruin what you're explaining. So two questions at that waterfall, did you get a straw hat? And then secondly, uh, uh, Nate, did you get approval to show these pictures? Cause I noticed they're all copyrighted Patrick phone. <laughs> he and I are going to have to talk through that later. His, his lawyers and my lawyers will get together. I'm sure we can figure something yeah. out. Here's what I thought. Um, royalties. <laughs> I, Google, I don't really trust so much. And so when I exported them out of Lightroom, um, I thought, you know what, I'm going to put a watermark on these just because they're on Google. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. But you'll notice some of these don't have the watermark, and that's because I didn't bring them in from Lightroom. Uh, I brought them in from something else. So. Yeah, and we'll talk about Lightroom in a minute here, too, because it's a super cool tool. Um, let's see. So as far as experimenting and trying stuff, I mean, do try out some depth of field tricks with bokeh with your subject. Try out some motion, motion blur tricks. Do the car tail light thing or do something with moving water. It's tons of fun. Um, we've got some other examples here too. Um, you can take multiple exposures and bring them together. This is a great experiment if you haven't done this. So with my with my Sony, I don't have a lot of that computational photography type tricks that I can do in the in the phone, right? A lot less processing power here, even though I have a fancier sensor. And so what I have to do to get an image that looks a lot like what my eye would see is I take three shots. You can take more, but I kind of like to do three. It's kind of a balance of you know, lots of photos versus the detail I want to get. I take one that's underexposed and one that's spot on. And I take one that's overexposed. You can see that means I've got stuff that's blown out. I've lost the detail 
and this cliff face right here and these rocks, but it's brought me in some nice stuff in these shadows I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And my guy over here that's underexposed, I lose a lot in the shadows. That detail is gone, but look at all the great detail I got here in this rock face and these cliffs and stuff. And then I can use software to bring these guys together. And my, my result over here on the right is I get my cool shadows coming in from this shot. I get my cliffs with all that great detail coming in from this shot. And a lot of the rest of it comes in from the one that's exposed properly. This is called HDR photography, high dynamic range. Um, and you could do this yourself. This is kind of one of the things I like to do with my Sony. I'll go out and do that and bring them in together and do it on my computer. And it's, it's a bit of work, but I like the results. The cool thing again, is we're focusing on, on phone photography, when you're, when you pull mine out here, this guy right here will always do this automatically. So computational photography performed on most modern phones these days means that I point this guy and I, I hit my shutter button on it and it automatically is taking a bunch of exposures. Depending on the brand of phone, it may be more or less, but it's doing the work all on its own with you, without you having to do anything to bring in all these kinds of details in the shadows, in the bright spots. You didn't have to think about it. You just thought you were taking one picture by tapping that shutter, but surprise, surprise, it's doing a bunch of work under the hood to bring you in a good photo like this. If you wanna play more with high dynamic range type photography, there are actually third party apps that you can buy to be able to play with how many exposures you're taking and how to merge them in. Um, and you can check for those. If you just do a search for HDR photography and in your app store or Google Play store, you'll find them and you can check that out. So then you're still using your phone, but you maybe you're doing some more creative things with different apps. So it can be a lot of fun. Patrick, do you do much with, with HDR? Yeah, every shot I take is pretty much HDR. Um, and that's actually a setting on your phone, right, Patrick? I mean, I have an yeah. iPhone, and I, and I want to say all of mine are HDR. I think I have all mine automatically set for HDR. And, and with iPhones, you can choose to have it keep all the original images and the HDR image, or you can have it um, keep a raw copy which I'm sure Nate's going to go into what raw means. Yep. Um, and, uh, but yeah, for me, I, I take it in HDR um, and then I usually do some touch-ups with, with something like Lightroom. Um, and, you know, if I'm using this guy, my, I have a couple of these, my GoPro. Um, it doesn't necessarily do the same it, it does a lot of tricks, um, aren't necessarily the same as what you do on your phone, but um, I shoot everything on this in raw. And when Nate gets to that, you'll kind of understand why I do that. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it, there's so many different ways to do things. Um, and, and the nice thing about having a camera like Nate's is that you're able to do a lot more um, with software to bring out certain details of pictures or change them or you know give them different colors um, than you are with just a phone photo. But at the same time, the phone photos are getting to be so good that you don't um, you don't really necessarily need that anymore, other than for the lens. Um, you know, I can't zoom in like I can with a, you know, a mirrorless or an SLR. Um, but I mean, I can zoom in on my, and out on my phone, but not to the degree of, of those type of cameras. So they're getting better. It they're getting better. Kind of depends on what you're doing. So that's a good point. We'll talk lenses on, on smartphones these days in just a minute. Another thing to experiment with, and I hope that you do is with panoramas. Um, this is one I took from the drone. Uh, I was up Big Cottonwood up toward Guardsman Pass. I wanted to shoot one, you know, down toward the <clears throat> the, the canyon there, but it, it was just too big to fit in a single exposure. And so, I mean, most most any drone or any camera phone these days allows you to take a panorama where it does all the stitching for you, does all the work, lines it all up, excuse me, lines it all up, and you get an image like this where you're truly capturing kind of the expanse of a big mountain range or a lake or some other scene all right there. And it's just, it's a great way to change things up try something new, capture some more. So experiment with panoramas too. Has everybody seen the panorama mode on their phones? Yeah, I've used mine a couple of times. Super cool. And some of the newer phones have wide angle, which is 
very similar to panorama um, and can capture quite a bit of detail that you would normally get on the panorama. The hardest part about a panorama and actually even with like a GoPro or a wide angle uh, type of shot is to, to keep a straight horizon. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. because of the way that it's shooting it naturally kind of does this and so if you're if you when you drag the the camera back and forth are doing this it curves that horizon in the in the way that that you did it and so that's that's always been tough for me to get a good panorama photo without having a weird looking horizon but sometimes you can even play tricks with that too which ends up kind of cool i have a couple on my gopro i can show you guys later um and i'll show you the difference between you know three different shots in the same spot just at different angles so yeah that'd be cool that'd be cool that kind of leads to composition too just kind of looking at it from different angles and doing different things uh speaking of experimenting and trying different things a lot of the backs of phones are looking like this these days uh, the one on the right, I joke about looking a lot like the uh, stove top in my kitchen these days. And, and this is, a, I think, a Galaxy Note 20 S3 on the back as well. And so even though you've just got your smartphone, the fact of the matter is you've got all kinds of different lenses to play with. Um, and, you know, when you're when you're working with something like my big Sony, right, you've got different lenses you can change out to give you different focal lengths and do different things with your shots. You don't even have to do that when you're working with a modern smartphone, right? So the phone on the right, iPhone 11 Pro, which is what I'm carrying these days too, gives you that wider angle one that Patrick was just talking about, uh, which is like a short um, focal length, you know, maybe a 20 millimeter, 24 millimeter kind of thing. It has kind of your standard lens, which is kind of a 35-ish millimeter kind of feel, makes it look a lot like what your eye sees. And then it's got one that's more zoomed in right I'm like like a longer focal length type lens and that's becoming very common on a lot of these phones and you'll see in your camera app how you can tap between the three of them usually um, and see just what that does to your scene that's super fun to do i was doing that out camping over labor day just kind of shooting shots of my of my campsite with the three different lenses and seeing how they look and it's it's a lot of fun you get a lot of different effects and shots that way and so that's another tool you can use in your tool belt for composition anybody play with the different lenses on their on their phones yeah, so, so go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, I was just going to say so I Nate, I actually do have the iPhone 11 Pro. So and I and I did get that because I, I do like to have the simplicity of shots. Um, so I I may have to sit down with you because my wife and I we we actually took a trip just her and I we went to Zion's beautiful. We took a couple of trips and I would say like the majority of all my pictures are with my iPhone uh, 11 Pro. I bet you there's some things that I, I could totally do with some of these pictures that I haven't even thought of doing. So I may have to meet up with you, just sit down and, cause I got some pictures that I think I could really make them look good. I just, I just don't have the, the education to really know like what I need to adjust. So I just was going One thing I like to do is if I, if I see a scene, with my pro um i'll take it at all three focal lengths oh yeah and then when i get home when i have a little bigger screen to look at it on i, I check it out and whichever one i like the best that's kind of the one i go with yeah um, here, here just sometimes i like them both <laughs> or all three yeah, of them so. you can keep them all you're not gonna run out of film right but we'll talk about post-processing and some of the things you can do to make those photos look amazing too in just a minute daniel i got some good ideas for you okay yeah, especially a place like Zion, you can't go wrong, you know, and that's the kind yeah, of- Yeah, I got some really cool pictures and maybe I could share like one or two just yeah. so you could take a look. I mean, I could share really quick, but um, anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you continue for sure. I'm, I'm yeah. learning here. Yeah, let's, let's grab them out and do it for sure. The kind of place that, that, I mean, Zion National Park and up in the mountains, the canyons is a great wide angle place because you can capture so much of the scenery that way. It can look amazing. The one gotcha with a wide angle lens though, with the, with the short focal length, it does start to make everything look a little bit smaller. So you can kind of, you know, like I say, take, take shots with all three, compare them like Patrick was saying, and then you'll kind of get a feel for the lenses as you're going forward. Uh, yeah. Let's see, we are cruising through here. Oh, one, one gotcha I will tell you too about smartphones. You guys have probably all seen in your camera app when you're, when you're pinching and zooming, right? When you're trying to get the shot. Be careful for that because a lot of, yeah, Patrick's shaking his finger because a lot of times that's giving you a digital zoom. Unless you're actually going to the focal length, oops, 
you're actually going to the focal length of one of these three guys, what you're really getting is a digital zoom and you're losing information. You're gonna have a grainier shot than if you hit the button for 0.5 and one or two or, you know, where you know- Yeah, you actually so about that, um, Brother Hanson, so that's where like an SLR cam would, would, would come into play, right? Because that's not digitally altered, right? That's why an SLR camera with a good zoom is always better when it comes to zoom shots. Is that not So a zoom lens is always going to be, it's always going to be optical. Exactly. So you don't lose information. Okay. So I just have my kit lens with my little Sony here that I got earlier this year. Love this camera, but the kit lens goes from 28 millimeters, which is kind of my wider. And then progressively as I turn the barrel of the lens will take me all the way up to a 70 millimeter, a little bit more of a zoomed in shot. And it's, yeah, there's no digital here. It's all going to be, going to be a nice smooth zoom but you don't you don't get that with a phone because you're kind of stuck. and if you want to zoom in even if even if you do want to zoom in you just take the picture at, at normal focal length and then afterwards you can always crop it yeah you're not it's no different than if you just zoomed in crop um, it later. yeah true true oh, better crop it later no doubt yep great tip good okay let's get into some propeller head stuff you guys ready for the science behind all this all right when you're working with a camera there's a triangle we call it the exposure triangle just like you see here this side over here you're probably familiar with your shutter inside your camera the speed at which it opens and closes is part of this triangle when you've got a fast shutter like this it's going to let less light in up here when you're down here with a one second opening boy you better hold that camera still because that shutter is going to be open for a full second right hope you got your tripod this side is maybe not one you've talked a lot about, certainly not as far as thinking in terms of camera phone. This is your aperture. This is the actual opening that's you know outside of the, of the sensor there, right? Now your typical camera phone, like our guys here that we've got, they don't allow you to adjust your aperture. It's fixed, okay? You don't get to choose, yeah, F2.8 where it's all the way open and letting in lots of light, or F22 where it's pinched down really small. And only, you, you get whatever the camera manufacturer gave you and that's the end of the story. That's another reason to go with a guy like this, where I've got full control over this exposure triangle. Um, but it's okay, there's other stuff we can do. If we can't adjust this side down here, we can fiddle with these other sides to get the thing how we want it as far as the light, right? ISO doesn't actually stand for anything anymore. It's really weird. Back in the film days, um, you would actually, I don't know if you, maybe your Patrick is old enough, he'll remember this, but you used to buy 100 film or you would buy 400 film. Anybody remember doing that? Yep, I do actually. That's different. Good, good, Daniel. Okay, you're old like me. That makes me feel better. Okay, so, <laughs> so this is referring to the actual speed at which the film or the sensor these days reacts to the light that hits it. Okay, but there's a caveat. Down here is, is less sensitive. Over here is more sensitive, okay, to the light. But when we start, why would you ever want stuff that's not sensitive, right? Wouldn't we always want to have something that's super fast and sensitive to the light? The farther up this side of the triangle you go, the more noise and grain you get. So if I'm shooting a basketball game, man, it's really cool to have 1600 speed because I can freeze those players in the basketball or whatever exactly where they're at. Okay, I can do that super fast because this is very sensitive, but I get a little bit of grain in it. And you can see that sometimes as you're looking at sports shots versus, you know, maybe something else. So some apps, camera apps on your phone will allow you to adjust the ISO. This is something a sensor in a, in a phone or certainly in any other camera you have, you can adjust. Um, just depends on the app. I know Apple with their, with their standard app that comes on your phone, they don't like to expose that kind of stuff to you. They keep it really simple. But if you- It's all by, automatic on those. They, yeah. they choose it for you. If you go by Halide Camera, which is a third party app, which I believe is available for Android and for iOS, Halide Camera lets you set your shutter speed yourself and it will let you set your ISO sensitivity. You can do all this stuff except for the aperture because you're fixed there, right? But look at third party apps, it might be kind of entertaining because then you have a little bit more control over what's going on with, with these different sides of the triangle. Why am I showing you this? Because you can do neat tricks when you adjust your um, exposure triangle. Like I was showing you earlier with the, with the moving water and the tail lights and all that kind of stuff, you do that with a slower shutter speed. The cool things where the background is blurred, that bokeh effect with the shallow depth of field, you do that with a really big open aperture like this. So knowing about your exposure triangle allows you to play some cool tricks. 
if you want to make starbursts out of the sun as it comes over the horizon and kind of shoots out those little rays like you saw in that first shot I showed you, you do that with a really tight, tiny aperture like this over here. So there are games you can play once you kind of understand what's going on with the exposure triangle. How's that, Colorhead? Is, is that a bit much? That's doing all right? Nobody, nobody you know loves it. What I always find confusing about aperture is that it's backwards. Yeah. The smaller the f stop or aperture is, the more light it's letting in. And yeah. it, it always throws me off. <laughs> the smaller the number, the bigger the opening. It's very weird. I agree. <laughs> yep. But just something you kind of have to memorize. And as you tinker with it, you'll figure it out. It's something you can play with. Uh, let's see. Let's do some more nerd stuff. Um, let's see. Camera types. Let's talk about cameras for a minute. So once we've moved beyond what's inside of here, and we start looking at things that are standalone cameras, for many, many years, there was an SLR camera. Stands. This is the SLR right here. Single lens reflex. That stands for the fact that you used to have film or your sensor nowadays back here, and the eyepiece up here had to be able to see the same thing the film was gonna see. And the way they accomplished that was a lot of really cool moving parts. Okay, you had your lens that was over here sticking out the front, the light would come in and hit this guy on this angle right here, that's a mirror. And the light comes in, hits the mirror, bounces up here, and there are more mirrors. In fact, it's a big old prism. They call it a pentaprism, you see down here on number seven. It would bounce up here, bounce over here, here, and then it would hit your eye looking through the eyepiece. Crazy. So who knows why they do that? I'm What's just that? curious. So who knows why they did that? Bouncing it off multiple locations. Why would that be? But wouldn't they have to account the image being upside down? Uh, exactly. Yeah, it's reversed, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I was just thinking about that. I'm like, wouldn't it all be reversed? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right? You've got to- so I, When I was a kid, I- Sorry, Nate. When I was a kid, I did a little, uh, I don't know if it was a science project or something that we, I got with a, a friend uh, of my dad's who is a professional photographer and we did a pinhole camera. And um, cool. the image that we took with this pinhole camera was, was reversed. Yeah. And so we had to get the negative and then redo it you know, the other way around. <laughs> so, but the actual image itself that was on the film when it was all done was reversed. So. Isn't that cool? Yeah, hmm. for, for that same principle with the light. Now, we've come a long way. These days, we don't need to have mirrors bounce and stuff around. Things are more digital, right? So this particular camera I've got, my little Sony that I love, um, it's funny, if you look at it up close up top here, it looks like it still has kind of this pentaprism shape, but this is like, it's vestigial. It's like your appendix. You don't need it anymore. Really what's going on inside here is like this diagram on the right. Okay, the light just comes shooting straight on through the lens, the shutter's right here, and boom, hits the sensor. And the way that the viewfinder works is actually, it's a, it's a screen. <laughs> it's, it's basically the same thing as down here. It's just using another screen to show it. If you, if you were to look into my eyepiece here in the back, that's what you'd see, it's just the, just the screen. So we've come past all of this. The battery life is not super great on some of the mirrorless cameras that were early ones. This is a model from about six years ago. It just got cheap enough that I could afford it here this last year. But um, mirrorless cameras are super cool. And this is the same principle that your, that your phone camera works off of, right? There's, there's no mirrors flipping up out of the way to expose the film anymore. Uh, it's just straight exposure from the lens right on through to the sensor. But now you'll know. Hey, another thing, desktop. like the old school cameras, did did it simply just move that first mirror that it hits to go straight? Like when you actually hit the button, is that what it simply did? Is it just moved the mirror? Yeah. So if you ever if you ever you know press the shutter button on an old SLR camera, you hear and you hear it. It's like chunk <laughs> sound. Yep, yeah. It's a little chunk sound because the mirror goes whoop up out of the way and makes it so the shutter can then open and expose the film. It okay, was, that's what I thought. Okay, very analog, and this was something that even happened with some of the. There are still DSLRs today, right? That's what that means. Is it's a digital single lens reflex camera. It's still got the flippy mirror inside, and we're yep. beginning to work past that to get more into this mirrorless type of thing. But it's it's relatively new. All right, let's talk about sensor size. Patrick brought up the sensor itself. You may hear, oh, this camera has this many megapixels, and this camera has that many megapixels. You want to know something interesting? This guy, my Sony, and my iPhone purport to have the same number of megapixels that they capture in the image. Okay, they're both, what are they, like 20 megapixels, I think, on either one of those. Guess what, though? The sensor itself is totally different night and day. 
The reason I love my Sony is because it's a full frame camera. You'll remember 35 millimeter film back in the day. Well, a full frame sensor means a 35 millimeter sensor is inside the camera. And you can only imagine how much light a sensor that size is gonna reel in versus maybe something down here. Look, here's, here's your Apples and your Samsungs and, and the crop on, on the sensor that you get with those. That's why a lot of times phones where they really struggle is in low light and they're having to work a lot harder with computational tricks to bring things in and take multiple exposures so that it looks okay in low light because you're reeling in a whole lot less light than you are with something that's big like this. You may hear as you're shopping for cameras or looking at different things about APS-C. That's another format that's very popular with Canons and Nikons and Sony makes those too. Um, they're, yeah, they're crop lenses, but they're bigger. Um, four thirds and the you know, portable cameras and those kinds of things are down in this range. Or you may see somebody who's got like hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in camera equipment and they may have what's called a medium format camera, which is this big outline <laughs> clear around here. I don't have one of those. Uh, I'd, I'd have to sell my house or something to get that kind of equipment probably. But um, a nice full frame camera makes a big difference, especially in low light. I'm really hoping this fall to get out to some nice dark skies where I can use this big full frame sensor on some astrophotography, being able to take pictures. Hey, speaking of, of that, yeah. <laughs> next weekend's a full moon, or sorry, a new moon. New moon, yeah. If anybody's interested, I was, I was thinking, I'm not 100% sure yet, but I was thinking about going back out to Antelope Island and you can get some really good shots of um, low light stars and other things, especially with, with no moon. So yeah, yeah. My if dad anybody's interested, day, let me know. He had a big telescope. He used to go to star parties and they happen every once in a while too. Yeah. 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 Same kind of conditions you want for a star party or, or, or what you want with a night, you know, kind of photography trip. Patrick, I got to check my calendar, but I would love to do that. That'd be a lot of fun to get out there and shoot. Yeah, if anybody out. else is interested, let me know. We can, yeah, we can go out there. Yeah, so. super heat up. That'd be a lot of fun. Let's talk about um, file formats real quick. I mean, as photography has become digital, we no longer have negatives. We no longer have prints. I mean, we do, but it's printed out on a printer. It's like a, you know, a Word document or something. But there's a big difference as far as how the data that comes off your image sensor is stored. When you have data that is stored in its completeness and just kind of saved off to a file, you get a great big old file, but it's called raw. And what that means is it's got everything that came off that sensor. It may not even look that pretty at first, okay? You have to do a little bit of work to make it look as nice as what they're showing us here in this example. By the way, these are the first shots that uh, are not mine. I didn't take these. This was somebody else in a photo tutorial. Um, but contrast that with a JPEG on your typical portable camera or your typical smartphone camera too, what you're getting is called the JPEG. You're familiar with that. It's an image format that has been processed. So it's taken the raw information straight out of the sensor and it's done its best to try and make it into a pleasing image for you. However, as part of that, a JPEG is lossy. It loses some of that information. And so sometimes where you're able in post-production to bring out some of these nice cliffs and stuff, you don't have that information any longer when you save it out as a JPEG because that initial raw information off the sensor is gone. You've only got, you know, what the, what the process well, compressed. After so yeah, I mean, well, well, yeah, I was going to say, so JPEG is what, what is it like one eighth the size of a raw? Uh, it depends on it's the like sensor. something crazy like that. But yeah, they're, they're always much larger because it's got a lot more information in it. Now, if you're taking, and if you look at a raw <laughs> image, like just by itself, without doing any processing, it actually looks pretty ugly. Yep. It looks dull, but that's because it's got all of the information in it and it isn't trying to pretty it up like, you know, software computational photography does. And so it's up to you to process that, which is I think where Nate was going with this. So You have to pretty it up yourself. Exactly, Patrick. I thought since we got a little bit of time, you guys want to see how that process works? Let's, uh, let's do it real quick. Sure. Let's see if I have, Lightroom. So Adobe Lightroom is kind of the gold standard for photo processing. There are other folks that have products out there and they, they may be good as well, but a lot of folks have just gravitated to this over the years. Um, and you'll notice a lot of these are probably some that I've shared or even we've looked at in this presentation. But let's bring in a fresh one uh, that's a raw format and see what we can make out of it. Uh, let's see. Let's add photos. We're gonna to go to a spot from some ones, let's see, pictures. 
as you can see how I organize stuff on my on my hard drive, which is really not all that well. But I was while up, you're doing that, Nate. Um, yeah. So this is Lightroom. It obviously costs money. Um, typically, it, you know, these days it's a subscription. Mm -hmm. But there's also some other apps out there that are either a one-time purchase or free um, on a computer or on a I, you know a tablet or a phone or whatever. Um, Google makes a, a couple. Um, so, you know, Lightroom's great and, and, you know, most people that are into photography like to use it, but they're, you know, you don't have to start there. You can use something like Snapseed or, or Procreate or something like that to yep. do similar things. And I would add Lightroom's just kind of the industry standard. So it is awesome. It's, does iPhoto just in general, cause, cause I have a Mac, does iPhoto do similar things? Just iPhoto uh -huh. itself? It does. It does. I don't think it's quite as capable as, as what Lightroom is. But the sure. thing I'm going to tell you about Lightroom that is really cool, um, you have to pay for the subscription to use on your desktop. But since we're talking about phones a lot tonight, Lightroom on your phone, totally free. You go get a copy oh, of okay, that. Cool. It'll do almost everything that I'm going to show you on my desktop, but you can do it with no charge at all. I think, it, I think that goes for iPad as well, now that I think about it, if you happen to have a tablet. It's the same kind of thing. Let me look at these. I want to bring in, I'm going to bring in three images actually to play with real quick. That one is pretty dark. This one's a little bit lighter. Let's see, that's a different shot, isn't it? I wanna, I wanna show you how I do the HDR process. Let's bring these three guys in and see what they do. So the, again, this is kind of my darker and lighter ones I'm gonna add in. Review these for import. Lightroom goes, okay, here they are. DNG is a digital negative file. This is what I get out of my drone. Um, it's actually a raw file. They, some manufacturers use different you know, extensions and stuff, but it means the same. It's the raw data coming off that sensor. And if we look at them, you know, right here without any work on them, uh, not great, okay? They're not beautiful. But the first thing I wanna do is show you the process by which I take kind of the darker one, the lighter one and all that and make them into a single image. So I select the three and tell it to do a photo merge and say, hey, HDR merge these for me, would you? And it's doing most of the work. And it's gonna create a preview for me, bringing in the highlights, and the shadows and pulling them in together so that everything is as visible as it can be. And then we can tweak it further ourselves. Look at that already. Wow, that's a big improvement. Okay, so it is doing the alignment. It is doing all of this deghosting, bringing in the right exposure levels on them. And it's also applying some auto settings. That's part of why it looks so nice. Lightroom is smart enough that it's just automatically gonna find the right values as far as color temperature, that kind of thing. Um, speaking of which, while I'm letting this merge, we're doing a little bit of work here. I mentioned color temperature earlier when you're shooting indoors and that kind of thing. If you shoot in RAW, you can adjust the color temperature later. If you shoot in JPEG, you're stuck. You can't cool it off or warm it up at all. And what I mean by that is, let's bring up my HDR image now. Here's what it's looking like. And I have all of these great sliders and tools inside of Lightroom. One of those is my temperature slider. You may have noticed if you looked at a lot of my shots, even tonight, or maybe have seen my Instagram, I love shots that look a little bit warmer, okay? So 5200 is the default coming off of this in here now, but I, I love a little bit more warmth to my shots. So I'm gonna slide that guy over a little bit. I love that. That makes it look more like what I saw that morning as the sun rose. Um, so that's a great shot there. And we, have, we can play with these for hours, but you have a lot more flexibility when you're working with these raw images. And then, when you want to share it with your friends or post it to your favorite social media site, then you make a JPEG. But you're in control when you're playing with things in Lightroom. So RAW, I don't know that most of the default camera apps on your phone will save a RAW file for you, but there are tons of third-party camera apps that will. I know Halide does. Patrick, do you use some other ones? Yeah, there's like Camera Plus. Um, Good one, yeah, I like them too. There's uh, Filmic Pro. There's even a Photoshop camera. Um, which is an app by Adobe. I think that was free. Too. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. There, if you look in the App Store, even in uh, Android and and Apple, um, you'll see. Just look, you know, search for the word "raw" and you'll see. Well, be careful with that search, but um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's uh, already up here. <laughs> put camera in front of that, but yeah, yeah you'll see which ones do that. So. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I have so much control over boosting any of these colors, textures, dehaze tool is one of my favorites, especially with all the smoke we have in the air. I can, I can bring this in real sharp and nice, or I can back it off if it's too much. 
right? I have so much control over playing with the sharpening. Uh, if I go think of it this way too, like, so Nate, you mentioned, you know, color temperature and, and things like that and, and raw versus JPEG. So you could, you, you can use an app and do some tricks on a JPEG and, and change the, the settings and whatever, but think about it this way. If you're using a raw image and changing all of that on a raw image, you're actually changing the, the values that are in the actual file, right? If you're, if you're doing that over a JPEG, you're, you're literally like painting over it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, you might get it to look somewhat good, but it, if you're comparing a raw image to a non-raw image and you're trying to adjust, you know, temperature and other things like that, you're going to lose a lot of depth or other detail inside of your picture. Um, and that's kind of the main difference between the two. So it's all depending on what you want. I mean, if you're, if you're after the, the perfect shot, the one you want to hang on your wall, you're going to want to do raw, right? If you're after just a quick, easy, snap a cool picture, post it on Facebook or whatever, maybe you don't want to do that. So it, it's all, it all depends on what you're after. And that's what's so cool about everything these days is you can do anything you want and depending on what your purpose is get anything you want out of it uh, if you know where to look yep totally agree let's do a couple more cool uh lightroom tricks um healing brush there's one that's in photoshop uh, photoshop might cost you money but i mean here you can play with this i'm just going to drag over this guy's cabin here and there we go that's going to grab me a spot over here replace it in there let's see how that looks it's going to look pretty good I think if I go back to my one-to-one, -one, you won't even notice that cabin is just gone out of there. So we can play games like that. Um, if I want to brush certain things, maybe I want to bring in the valley a little bit more. Check this out. I can, let's make my brush a little small. You can do a selective edit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So I can drop down in here like this and just bring in the valley, maybe a little more. And I can drop down my exposure once I've done that. So that it shows up a little more. You wouldn't want to go that far. It starts to look ugly, but I can play with things like that and change my exposure. I can, I can bring up highlights and shadows, bring up the black so you can see some of the shadows down in there a little bit more. I've got things where I can selectively edit just little spots right in here. Lots and lots of powerful tools. Again, there's a subscription required to be able to do this on your desktop, but many, many of these tools are available in Lightroom, which is totally free on your phone or your iPad. It's limited, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I was going to mention, so um, I do like to go out um, and take drives in my car. So I'll take like a Saturday and wake up. And I, I, I hate to say this, but I've been doing it all wrong, I think. <laughs> like I, I got some pretty good shots, but I don't think any of them are raw. Like that. I mean, I just took them with my iPhone 11, right? But I know. Well, maybe. it just depends on what you're doing. I mean... Are you going to go back and do like some post process and, you know, hang this up on your wall? I mean, maybe you aren't going to do that. Well, and... it's funny that you say that because I got a really good shot and I actually took it to Costco and I printed it on like a metal frame that they offer. Oh, nice. And it was a really good shot. I mean, it was good and I could show you the original, but, but like, I think it could have been better. Well, then have tools you can you can tinker with it and uh, and see if you can bring out some more of those colors or crop it how you need. You've got you know you've got tools you can try, uh, and then as you go out in the future with your next trip out with your car or whatever, make sure that you're shooting something that will give you some raw, and then play some of these composition tricks like we've talked about with your rule of thirds and getting good light, maybe looking for some leading lines. Oh. And so, uh, you know something else to hang on your wall. So for the iPhone 11 Pro, what is what is the the application that you guys recommend for sure to get raw pictures? I like Halide, but I mean there is a variety. There are so many. Uh, Patrick, what do you? How, prefer? how do you write it? Oh, Halide is H. Uh, I gotta look. I think it's two L's. H A L L I D E. I'm gonna I look. Right I just put it in the chat. H A L. -L My bad. H A L I D E. Halid? You know, you don't have to have a pro either. You can have like an eight or a seven plus or, um, you know, a lot of this, the main difference between, you know, like an iPhone seven or eight or an 11, it, it's mainly just uh, the quality of the sensor and the different uh, 
uh, focal lengths, but I mean, half the pictures you saw of mine weren't taken by an iPhone Pro 11 Pro. I mean, you know, they were taken by older versions. So, it, you know, you can do lots of things. I was going to show you guys a quick example real fast, Nate, if you don't mind. Do we can stop recording if you want. I mean, let me flip it over to yours. Let's keep the recording going. People will love this. Let's see. Now, how do I share my screen? Okay. Uh, down at the bottom, the bar should give you a green share screen button. Oh, there it is. Is it called? Is it called Halid camera? That's the one. H A L I D E camera. That's the one I like. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Premium, raw, and manual. Okay. Cool. So this is a trick I played with selective edit. Uh, and I don't have Lightroom on this computer, so I can't show you how I did it. But um, we took, you know, a handful of pictures. This is my brother-in-law and his his wife. I took their engagement photos. I actually took them both with my phone and with Nate's camera. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but this is one I actually used my phone with, and and the light that was right here wasn't very bright. So what I did is I, you know, I cleaned up the picture the way I wanted it. And then um, I selectively edited this section in the kind of the shape of a heart. And then I blew it out. I just turned on the max exposure and the light and everything like that. And it, it looks pretty cool the way that it's, that it's set up. And that's actually the one they used on their actual invitation out of all the other ones I took. That's this right. was just a gimmick that I was just messing around with, and that's the one I liked. That's um, funny. But I also wanted to show you guys. So when I was out at Antelope Island a couple of weeks ago, unfortunately, the moon was really bright. So yeah. It was really tough to get some good star pictures. But um, it's my GoPro has a wide angle, which is very similar to panorama. And, and so this is if... I have my camera pointed like up and it sees the horizon down below. See how much it curved it? Yeah. So then if I adjust it just slightly down, it curves it a little less. Yep. But then if I get it dead straight, there's a straight horizon. And, you know, I've used my rule of thirds like, that Nate's been talking about where I wanted mostly sky, but I, had, I wanted some land in there. Um, and so you can see, you know, the bottom third is land and, and the top two thirds is the sky. So um, when I go out next time, hopefully, see how you can see shadows here? Yeah, that moves. <laughs> That's because right. my GoPro is so light, it lets in so much light on light on nighttime mode that whenever there's a, a moon out, it, it's like daytime. You know, it's just so bright. And it has to be able to do that or else you won't capture any stars. So stars obviously to a, a small camera lens are gonna give off very few, or you know, the light it's gonna give off is very small. So, you know, you have to have a camera that will- What's, what's the GoPro that you there. use, Patrick? So I have an eight, um, I think it's an eight. Yeah, the, the newer one. Um, I got it when it was on a Costco sale. I think I-, cool. I is it the is it the the hero eight black yeah it's the newer one and i have a seven as well um but i didn't even realize that they even had like a night mode yeah it's really neat like you can do like night laps where it takes a whole bunch of shots and then it looks like the sky is kind of moving um you can I need these, to set know, up like, like, like this a working is, session with you and, and Brother Hanson. <laughs> well, let's, let's see well this shutter, like the shutter on this particular shot was probably open for 30 seconds. Wow. So if you think about that, obviously I had to use a tripod, right? Oh yeah, of course. Um, if I had held that in my hand, it would have just been a big mess of nothing. So is that how you so, made the shooting star? Was it because you had the shutter open so long? Or so like I'm going to give you a little secret. It looks like a shooting star, but it's really an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Nice. But we'll pretend it's a shooting star. <laughs> it looks great. It looks great. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I, I did a whole bunch of different... This is actually the moon. It looks like the sun, but it's actually the moon. Right. Yeah, it's a know? And yeah. so... 
That was huge. Just think of how much darker the sky would be, though, if the moon wasn't out that night. So that's kind of why I was pretty interested in going out possibly next weekend, yeah. just depending on what time. And, you know, really about 9 or 10 o'clock is, is kind of prime time. Um, see, even this is – tell me what time. This is at 9.13 mm -hmm. um, on September 1st, so what, two weeks ago? And I'm still getting that glow from – the sunset, which was probably an hour and a half before that, you know, but it's, it's the way so the light lets have, it in. Uh, talking about the golden hour and the blue hour, d does anybody have like a chart that actually kind of shows those windows throughout the year? Is, does something do. like that exist? It's probably an app out there. Exactly. I was going to say, grab an app. The, the one that everybody uses is called Photo Pills. Um, and photo pills does a lot. It's a beefy app, but it, it will help you plan your shots, the time of day to take them all through the year. It keeps track of when the sunset is, so you know, when golden hour would start, when it would end and when blue hour would begin, all of that. It's, it's all built. It's a great app. I love that for planning. And what is it called again? Photo pills, P-I-L-L-S. Photo pills. Okay. The other thing I was going to mention to you guys too, is that pretty much every camera or phone or anything these days, when you take a photo, keeps what's called metadata um, and certain apps like Google for example or Lightroom does the same thing it, it will sh it can display the metadata to you so it can show you okay I really like this shot what were the settings that my camera did automatically to get this shot right and so it tells me the f-stop and there's oh, my 30 second app you know aperture was open for 30 seconds um, three millimeter focal length and then my ISO. And so it's kind of nice to look at that metadata every now and then to say, how did I do that? You know, and I mean, how did my camera do that? So that if I want to do the same thing in the future, and I don't want to rely on something automatic, I can go through and I can set my settings manually to do what it is I want. So it's kind of neat that, you know, most apps that are, you know, into photo editing and things like that, keep your metadata for you and it's it's all tied into the picture and so whenever you submit a photo through like twitter or facebook or any of that stuff um you know they most people can see what kind of camera you use so if you ever see those commercials like iphone is the most used camera in the world well what they've done is they've gone to you know various photo sites like Flickr or other things like that and they've looked at the metadata to see well what kind of cameras did they use and then they'll say well iPhone cameras are the ones that are the most used and so that's our advertising pitch and so yeah metadata is, is pretty nice to, to look at every now and then. So. Mm -hmm. Let me share just a couple more quick slides and then we'll let you guys go hopefully I haven't put you to sleep but I want to I want to share a couple of ideas as we finish up that I want, I want you guys to, to find my share button again now. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Thanks. Sorry about that. All right. So get inspired as, as you've talked about things tonight, the next thing I would say a great next step is to look at other people's photography. Um, go hit up Instagram, go hit up Flickr, even go to YouTube. Um, this next link I have down here, uh, is an educational channel. Tony and Chelsea Northrup are, are great educators when it comes to photography. They'll start with the basics. They can walk you through and spend a whole lot more time than we did tonight about all these different concepts. And then they get deep. I mean, they know their stuff, talking about particular lenses, different techniques, all kinds of things. A great YouTube channel to subscribe to and learn more. Um, look at examples of great photography. Austin Mann, known for his iPhone photography. He's branched out a little bit more now and is doing things with drones and other cameras and stuff, but terrific stuff at his site, austinman.com. Trey Ratcliffe is one of the early pioneers in that high dynamic range technique. This guy, I believe now has moved to New Zealand. And so most of the shots he shares with people are just, I mean, eye popping. New Zealand is amazing. And he's doing all these great things with HDR. Go to visit some of these places, find your own, just Google images. And, and it'll inspire you, you know, to take your own shots, kind of doing your own thing. And I can, I can share these links around with you guys. Um, I want to I wanna invite you to do two things tonight, because every presentation is, is most powerful when, when there's an invitation at the end, right? One is, see if you can grab an app from somewhere that will allow you to shoot in RAW, that will shoot the RAW sensor data right off, right off of your camera, and that way you can play with it. 
grab Halide, grab, you know, Camera Plus, doesn't matter, whatever it is for the particular phone that you have, grab that. And then the next thing, once you're comfortable shooting raw, see if you can start to shoot manual. And by manual, I mean where you pick the ISO, the sensitivity of your sensor, where you pick the shutter speed, okay, where you can start to play with some of those things so you're getting a feel for the photo that you're taking. The computer's not doing it all for you. You're starting to do some of your own, and that will make it so that you're taking steps toward being able to, I mean, be in charge of a, of a beast like this or some other camera you've got and shoot in manual. Eventually, you'll become more comfortable than shooting in, in auto. I don't like shooting in auto because I'm like, ah, I'm a control freak. I, wanna, I want the photo to be the way I want but it takes a lot of practice. So those are my two challenges for you. 